Wait, right, Good gonna... afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, Medical Legal Evaluation of Burns. The information presented by the expert is not to be used as legal advice and does not indicate a working relationship with the expert. All materials obtained from this presentation are merely for educational purposes and should not be used in a court of law. Since the expert's consent, i.e. a business relationship, where she or he is hired for your particular case. In today's webinar, Dr. Zayden will discuss death of burn, systemic complications, assessment and management of electrical and chemical burns, electrical burns, chemical burns, and closing statements. To give you a little background about our presenter, Dr. Thomas Zayden has over 20 years of experience as a board-certified plastic surgeon and specializes in a variety of procedures. Dr. Zayden works in conjunction with patients who have experienced trauma with resilient scars, burns, first, second, and third degree, including catastrophic cases. He uses multiple skills, including scar revision, laser therapy, massage, hyperic oxygen, biologics, and other associated products to reduce and minimize scarring. Attendees who require passcode, the word for today is scar. Burn, I'm sorry. During the Q&A session, we ask that you enter this passcode into the Q&A widget for CLE reporting purposes. The Q&A is located to the left of your screen. Please remember that if you're applying for CLE credit, you must log on to the computer as yourself and stay for the full 60 minutes. You are also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. Please note that CLE credit cannot be given to those watching together on a single computer. Tomorrow morning, we will send out an email with the link to the archive recording of the webinar. The slides can be downloaded from the resource list at the bottom of your screen. Thank you all for attending today, and Thomas, the presentation is now turned over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, burns represent one of the most severe, complex forms of injury. Um, the costs are enormous taking care of burns. It's a physical burn burden to the patient. It's a psychological burden not only to the patient, but the patient's family and caretakers. Every year in the United States, 30,000 people are admitted to burn units. Some of them are children. In fact, we have specialized children's burn units. The majority of burn victims, though, of the more significant type, are males. Actually, 68% of bad burns involve males involved in an accidental flame type of injury. And interestingly enough, the majority of these burns happen at home or in the backyard. We see a fair number of uh, barbecues that explode, and um, obviously people either ignore or are not aware of the safety rules, or the manufacturer sometimes doesn't let folks know uh, of some recalls. We've seen a lot of issues related to barbecue girls. Children are about one-fifth of the burn unit emissions, and they usually are scald burns. We see them uh, hot water burns, typically, uh, thermal burns. Uh, we don't see too many electrical burns in children anymore, but we do see a fair number of scalds. The good news is people dying from burns has gone down. In 2002, over 3,000 people died of burns and their complications in the United States. Ten years later, the number is closer to 2,500. But how does one predict who is going to survive a burn? How does one predict um, who is going to have issues with disfigurement? Well, it's a function not only of the burn, the burn type, but it's a function of the patient's age, and it's a function of how much of the patient is burnt. And we are certainly going to discuss that in detail because that's an important part of understanding the damages. Juries understand that burn injuries are painful. So my job is to describe the disfigurement, the permanency, the severity or lack thereof, and then the client will describe the emotional pain and describe the pain and the diminished self-esteem. We have worked with colleagues in these burn cases, especially the larger burns, to describe damage to adjacent structures. 
Because when scar tissue forms, that's when the body heals. The body heals by making a scar. So you heal a burn by making a scar. But sometimes the scar tightens the skin so much that you can't move bones or joints. So let me give my audience an overview of burns and give you some of my experience over the last 20 years with some interesting cases. First, the basics, and I apologize to uh, those of you that remember this from biology. Burns can be described as either first, second, or third degree, and there's an alternative method of describing them, which is either partial thickness or full thickness. Let me go to the classical description first. First degree is a sunburn, a scald type of burn. In this type of burn, usually there's no scarring, and almost always it's healed within a week or two. This is a first degree burn or a superficial burn. Unless the temperature of the water is extremely hot or the contact with the water is prolonged, it typically does not develop to a partial thickness burn. Now, this goes along with the first aid. Very often, when people are burnt, they're wearing pants. More often than not, when I've reviewed cases from uh, vendors that have accidentally spilled hot fluid on someone's leg or arm or chest, the clothing acts as an insulator. So a principle of burns is as quickly as possible neutralize the force, neutralize the depth of the burn. So that would have to do with taking the clothes off, and a lot of folks don't instinctively do this, and this makes the burn worse. And we'll talk about this in chemical burns as well, and we'll talk about this in terms of um, evaluating the temperature of the water that causes the burn. But a first-degree burn is, on the left, a scalding burn. A partial thickness burn is what we call also a second-degree burn. Now, the key word here for partial thickness is dermis. When the dermis is injured, and you look down below, you see the word dermis has been highlighted. That layer of the skin has to be violated in order to get a scar. So if the burn does not violate the dermis, I would not anticipate a scar reaction. And we'll get to that in a minute. And finally, a third degree burn is what is normally a catastrophic situation. This, you have skin that is no longer alive. It's charcoal, if you will. It's leathery. All layers of this, uh, the integumentary system, the skin, have been violated. I will mention, at least in my state, there are disability guidelines and percentages that go along with each of these depths of burn. Let me review this because this is important. Superficial. This is also called first degree. The skin is red, usually from a scald, a scalding type of injury. They are very painful, and they involve only the epidermis. The treatment is obviously remove the offending agent, remove clothing if it's acting as an insulator, cool compresses, and then aloe vera. There's no doubt that uh, a cool rinse right after a, uh, a burn is going to be helpful, um, except for a certain type of chemical burn, which I'll discuss toward the end. The, uh, occasionally, we see burns that are mixed superficial first degree with elements of second degree. When that is present, that would indicate scarring and permanency. And this is often what we see with an airbag situation. With an airbag deployment where you have what looks to be superficial burns, sometimes the nauseous chemicals from the airbag cause scattered areas of second degree. Partial thickness is also called second degree. Here, again, you have pain. In fact, the pain is much more intense than it is with first degree. You usually have a blister and it involves both layers. The, in general, we don't open up the blisters because they act as a biological barrier. 
and we basically are very gentle with these uh, second degree burns. They do leave a mark. They are permanent, there is scarring, and there are things that we can do as plastic surgeons to ameliorate that scarring. That's a second degree burn or a partial thickness. And I apologize for the basics. I just wasn't sure if the audience would all remember these important distinctions. Third degree, um, very, very much a catastrophic type of situation. You can have dry, leathery skin. In fact, there's so much dry, leathery skin that the nerves have been um, have, have died. They have necrosed, and that's why there is little pain early on with third degree burns. All the layers are involved. Third degree burns require the care of a doctor. If something is no longer alive, it has to be uh, removed. Uh, it's a principle in plastic surgery that necrotic skin is an incubator for infection, and this would indicate uh, a burn that requires treatment. Now, we look at a burn, we only have the depth, we have two other factors that are very important. They are, number one, the age of the patient and, of course, the patient's overall medical condition. And second, the size of the burn. And when you look at medical records, you're going to see reference to what they call BSA or body surface area. Now, this is quite important because, in general, the more body surface area that is injured, the worse the prognosis. This is a generalization, but the percentage of full thickness burn, body surface area injured, plus the patient's age, gives you a very rough estimate of the patient's chance of not surviving this burn. So again, the patient's age plus their body surface area gives you a very rough estimate of their chance of not surviving the burn. For example, a 50-year-old with a 50-year-old um, with a 50% body surface area, 30%, would almost certainly be facing uh, his demise or her demise. We also, as an estimate, can use your palm. If you look at your palm, that is roughly, roughly 10% of the body surface area. So when you're talking to a jury, if you say someone has, um, you know, a 10 palms of, of, of burn, that pretty much would say the whole body's been burned. But that gives you a rough estimate. When we decide who goes to a burn unit, we, we not only look at the depth of the burn, we look at the age of the patient, and we look at the um, amount of body surface area involved. And these tend to be very sick patients that require very specialized care and, again, very costly. This is a rule of nines. Uh, um, again, if it's basic, I apologize. That gives you a rough idea of, um, uh, of, of a burn, uh, how we come up with body surface areas. Very rough ideas, but still frequently seen in uh, medical records. And then I talked about the rule of palm, but it's a very general, general guideline. Importantly, and we're going to talk about all types of burns, but in the more significant burns, there are problems outside the burn wound. And very often, when I evaluate these uh, clients, I recommend consultations not only with psychology, but consultations with neurology because adjacent nerves are often injured. If it's a electrical burn, we may recommend a consultation with cardiology because uh, electrical energy tends to uh, injure cardiac tissue. But even early on, we work as a team. I work in a burn unit, and it doesn't just have plastic surgeons on staff. We have everybody from social work to rehab to uh, general surgery, internal medicine, because when the skin is disrupted, when there's a burn, the body loses its ability to protect itself. Skin is a very important uh, barrier, not only to infection, but it's a barrier to help the body regulate itself and keep itself in homeostasis. And burns wreak havoc on the skin. 
Burns cause proteins to leak, capillaries to leak. They cause electrolytes to go out of whack, hormones to become misaligned. And if the burn is significant enough, it heals with an eschar, which is a leathery product, which I will show you pictures of uh, shortly. So burns are an important case. Now, when I look at burns, uh, and again, I'm not the lawyer, but I, will, I have noticed that it's not just a matter of how the client has been injured. As you know, and it's your job to demonstrate to the jury, is they want to know the facts. Was the employer careless? Did the employer leave something around unlabeled? Did the uh, person at uh, the fast food restaurant, uh, was, was he or she in a rush? And I have seen, and uh, this is interesting, the, uh, the people that dispense these drinks have guidelines as to what temperature the hot water is to be. And there are malfunctions, and there are recognized guidelines for checking, and even major chains sometimes don't follow their own guidelines. And what we could do as an expert in plastic surgery and burns is give you an estimate of the temperature of the water. And of course, you'd have to, in a major case, you'd have to involve a scientist. But we can give you a rough estimate as to how hot that fluid was. I'm talking about the scalding type of burns. Because uh, in, the uh, juries know the burns are painful, but they also know that carelessness needs to have a message sent to it. Again, the greatest risk of infection is burn, is, is greatest risk of problems and complications is infection, and we do everything we can to prevent infection. We use silverdine, that's that white ointment that you may have seen, To uh, it's a silver, and it is antibacterial. Uh, we do everything we can to support the patient's age and health considerations, we treat the diabetes, so their blood sugar won't be high. Hopefully that will help avoid infection. And of course, as always, sadly, uh, smokers have a uh, prolonged healing period, as do diabetics. So these are all complications that we try to manage from the outset. So let's talk a little bit about electrical and chemical burns. And um, interestingly enough, the majority of electrical injuries have to do with either the um, person uh, supplying electricity or the person using electricity doesn't follow the safety rules. And electricity safety rules are well outlined and the, the majority, and this is documented in the literature, are due to people that don't follow the safety rules. One safety rule, which I hope that you'll never need, is if you see someone that can't let go, do not go on and touch that person because you'll become part of the problem. Energized lines act as a whip, and if someone can't let go, you have to turn off the power. You don't get them away from the line. Um, this is often asked, interestingly enough, if someone is struck by lightning, and in Florida we have a lot of people that are struck by lightning, that what we often do is worry, are they energized? People that are struck by lighting are not energized and can safely be evacuated by EMS. So what is the body's response to a burn? And this response is the same whether it's a first degree burn, a second degree burn, or a third degree, or again, a partial thickness or full thickness. And the extent of the response would depend upon, number one, the size of the burn, number two, the age and health of the patient, and number three, the width of the burn. The first stage the body does, and you may remember this from high school biology, is catecholamine release, fight or flight. That is the hormone that the body signals something is wrong. I've been burnt. So I either have to fight that burn or run away from it. And of course, there's anxiety, there's pain, the heart rate picks up, and there's an emergent phase. The second phase, and this is subsequent to the burn, and very often uh, people don't recognize how bad their burn is initially, whether it be an airbag, hot water, a flame, a barbecue, 
uh, they, they don't realize how bad it is initially because it takes 18 to 24 hours for the body to launch a response. The response can last as long as 24 hours. It reaches a peak in six hours. And the body initiates what they call an inflammatory response. The body's response to injury is inflammation. And there's edema, which is swelling. There's a inflow of uh, white blood cells, helper cells, to help clean up the area. And we, as plastic surgeons, what we try to do is manage the inflammatory response to the best of our ability to minimize the scarring. Prolonged inflammation is associated with additional scarring. So anything that we can do, and I'll explain the things that we can do in our evaluation when we talk about uh, future medicals, is manage the inflammation. We can do it with topicals to manage this fluid phase. We can do it with laser energies. We can do it with PRP. We'll talk about that briefly. We can do it with compression. Surgery is a very late part of all this. Unless there's eschar to be removed, unless there's dead skin to be removed, we tend, as plastic surgeons, not to do uh, scar revisions or burn revisions until we've tried all the alternative therapeutic modalities, which I'll discuss shortly. But the body's response to burns is, in the beginning, fight or flight, followed by this inflammatory response, which we try to control the best of our ability. Then the burn, regardless of size, in the period of days to weeks, the body starts to repair itself. In general, in general, if a burn is not healed in three weeks, it represents either a full thickness injury all the way across or a scattered full degree injury with areas of second degree. That's very important because very often uh, juries get hung up on second and third degree burns. There is ample evidence in the scientific literature that if a burn is not healed in three weeks, that you probably are dealing with a full thickness injury, at least in part. I apologize if some of this is basic. I have a very wide audience. Um, I'll try to put all t things for all levels here. But the body will heal with a scar. This is the resolution stage, and this is the lining up of the collagen. And this is kind of where we evaluate uh, permanency and damages. Now, electrical burns, voltage has to do with um, the difference in electrical potential. So the higher the voltage, the worse the potential, and the worse the damage is going to be. Amperes have to do with the strength, the uh, contusive power uh, of the electricity, and this has to be balanced against resistance. And then what you do is you look at the ratio between these three um, terms and you can get a sense of how much um, injury uh, is taking place. Obviously, somebody uh, who is well insulated against electricity, who we see as a fair amount of voltage, would not have the same injury as someone who is not as well insulated, for example. Um, electrical burns almost always have an entrance and exit wound, and I, uh, in general, the smaller the area of contact, the more concentrated the energy. As I mentioned previously, issue, uh, tissues of lesser resistance, such as blood vessels and nerves, they tend to receive damage that requires evaluation and management. So it's important to recognize that with all burns, uh, it's way more than what you see, more than meets the eye. This demonstrates a electrical burn. Um, in general, you're going to have a point of entrance and a point of exit. Um, the, the patient is the conductor of the current. And again, keep in mind that not only is there damage to the feet, there's damage to the whole person. These are catastrophic injuries, and I'm just showing them because they're very interesting, but they do demonstrate some of the principles. And the principles are that this patient 
is admitted uh, you know, to the hospital usually. Uh, skin that's not alive is removed. The cryo skin is removed to avoid infection. The patient is resuscitated. The patient is evaluated. And if necessary, if after three weeks or so, the burn is not healed, consideration for uh, applying uh, skin grafts. There is a evolving, before I describe skin grafts, there's an evolving technology now. We have skin from cadavers and artificial skin and skin that is built from scratch in a, in a test tube, believe it or not. And this is being applied very often either instead of or before skin grafts to help avoid infection and to manage pain. Yes, we can take some skin, put it into a test tube, and create a sheet of skin. Uh, we can't make it three-dimensional yet. We can't make it into a, a bone or a heart or a bladder, but we can make it into a piece of skin. So this is the sequela of an electrical burn. This is sometimes where I see the patient. I, this may be a patient that was seen in a burn unit across town. I didn't take care of him. And this is, comes to my office for a plastic surgical examination and evaluation. And uh, it's way more than a cosmetic situation. Uh, as I've gotten to evaluate these over the years, I realize that we have to look not just what you could see, but what you can feel and what you can touch. So you would describe the loss of texture of the skin. You would describe the skin appendages, which are compromised. You would describe the loss of hair follicles, the loss of the skin ability to thermoregulate. You would explain the patient would have difficulty perhaps kneeling uh, because of the fact that this is close to his knee and this scar would pull on his knee. This is far more than a cosmetic situation and I frequently ask Dr. Zayden this is cosmetic and I take offense at that because cosmetic is a facelift on an aging patient. Reconstructive is to take a victim of an accident Reconstructive is to take a victim of cancer and try to restore them toward normalcy. This is not a cosmetic situation. This is a functional situation, and even some plaintiff lawyers are not aware that there is a disability chapter related to the skin and intergamary system. And a patient such as this would have a considerable disability rating, at least in our state, which is very often overlooked. So that's the medical legal part. Describe the pain, how it bothers him, how there may or may not be a loss of self-esteem, uh, difficulty getting in and out of a car. It's good to describe for the jury uh, what the patient can't and can't do in their everyday living. Then what can I do? Where's, where's the science here? What, what can I instruct an audience of lawyers? There's a lot that we can do for this, and it goes way before cutting this out and, and sewing it up. The first thing that we could do is get this patient into compressive garments, which he'll need probably for the foreseeable future to be rotated periodically for freshness. If we can control the edema, we'll control the inflammatory response, and we'll get a better result. We can inject various medications, both topical and injected. Uh, perhaps, I apologize for all the ums. We can inject steroids. We can inject uh, various Alternative medicines such as uh, body, uh, take patient's own blood, separate out the plasma, separate out the stem cells, inject those healthy regenerative components into these burn scars, and you can actually make a nice improvement. And there's science for this. In fact, the Department of Defense sent me a um, returning veteran from Afghanistan who had a very similar injury to this electrical burn. He was in a tank that was burnt. And we had very good results with uh, alternative therapeutic modalities. So a lot can be done for this after it's fully evaluated. And if the laser doesn't give the patient maximum results and there's various lasers, and if the injections don't give maximum results or the PRP doesn't, then we can consider uh, plastic surgery as most people think of it. Now, plastic surgery would consist of removing the tissue that's not healthy, and providing healthy tissue, either adjacent healthy tissue or distant healthy tissue, to the sites of trauma. 
The costs for all these would be outlined in the report. They vary from state to state. They're well documented. We have relative value fee schedules, and we have um, what we call CPT codes, current procedural terminology codes. So it is very um, rep very reputable and also repeatable to uh, provide a report outlining the costs of restoring this person to a normalcy. And again, these are not cosmetic procedures. These are reconstructive procedures. They are considered medically necessary. This is a slide showing the homogenization of the dermis. This dermis has been injured. It, to, it, I, even though this is an electrical burn, it's very similar to various levels of uh, severity, whether it be a first, second, or third degree burn. And this is something you may want to show to the, the jury, showing them how the the burn may not look like much on top, but it's it's wreaked havoc down below. And again, demonstrating some various electrical burns. This slide is not so much to show an electrical burn, but to show a burn that was probably thought of, well, there's not much we can do here. We see some changes in skin color. We see um, maybe some uh, some whiteness. and That's about all I see. I don't see much of all here. It's not like a cosmetic thing to me. Well, a thorough examination of this patient showed many problems. First, uh, he could not perspire in this area. He couldn't thermoregulate in this area. Second, the um, patient had diminished sensation in this area, the diminished two-point sens sensation. Also, there was some itching and some burning. I could see when I look closely with my magnifying glass, uh, you can see some areas of uh, superficial excoriation where the patient was itching and burning. I also see changes in skin color that shouldn't be there. And if, if enough time has passed, they can be taught to recover utilizing laser energies. We have lasers that can stimulate the skin to get back to its pre-traumatic color. So a lot can be done. This is not just a cosmetic situation. And a reminder, electrical burns can cause cardiac problems. I'm going to jump over some of the science. We have seen some taser burns. Uh, uh, we are sometimes asked to evaluate the results of taser burns, and they do leave a permanent scar. If if it's a burn scar that's small like these, unlike the knees that I showed earlier, these may be they this may be amenable to excising it and revising it. This may be amenable to injecting it with uh, um, some numbing medicine and going ahead and revising it. This could be done either in the office or as an outpatient procedure. But almost always we wait for the wound to fully soften and mature before we do any sort of uh, revision of a burn. And down here in Florida, uh, we see a fair amount of electrical burns from lightning. And as a reminder, with these electrical burns, you have to be careful not to become part of the problem. So you see someone that's burnt hanging on to electricity line, he's uh, moving like crazy, uh, turn off the power. That's the next step. Okay, I'll go ahead that in a second. I want to talk a little bit about chemical burns in the time that we have left and, 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 and demonstrate some of the principles. Uh, one of the principles that I know... Dr. Zayden, uh, we actually have to stop yes. for a moment for our break, Okay. Um, if okay. all the attendees can enter in the passcode and for any questions that you have for Dr. Zayden, you can enter those now. The um, password is burn. Okay, and I just have a question. What is burn tunneling? Burn tunneling? I don't know. I, I hate saying that. I, I, I've not heard that expression. Uh, I'll Google it while we're getting other questions. Sorry. Okay. Um, you can continue with the presentation. Okay, let me take a second here with burn tunneling. The curious. Uh, 
Well, it doesn't come up, but if I come up with it, I'll. Uh, if anybody sends me an email, I'll try to let them know. Uh, I, I, okay. I can we imagine. Have actually have another. Yeah. Question. We actually have another question. Okay. If the body employs information as a defense to the trauma of a burn, is there a downside to limiting inflammation? That is so important. There is no downside whatsoever. Now, the only potential downside is if you limit the inflammation too early, it may slow down the healing process. So you want to allow the inflammation to do its job to get the patient uh, on their way to recovery. But at some point, and this is where you need a specialist, the inflammation becomes counterproductive and needs to be modulated. So early inflammation is a good thing. However, an expert in this type of work, doesn't have to be a plastic surgeon, will know when it's time to add steroids, either by mouth or by vein, to add um, other methodologies to modulate the inflammation. Because it is true, if we modulate the inflammation too soon, we're going to diminish the healing process and leave the door open for complications such as infection. Inflammation is, is where it's at, is monitoring, monitoring it and managing it and knowing where to intervene and where not to intervene. If I gave this lecture 10 years ago, we almost never intervened early. We almost never did anything until six months, a year, a year and a half down the line. We just said, it's up to God and Mother Nature and don't tamper. But there's enough scientific evidence today that early intervention at the proper time can give you a better outcome. Our next question, what disabilities result from taser burns? And also, are there articles on taser burns? Yes, there's many articles on taser burns. And of course, it depends upon the extent. Very often with taser burns, consultations not only with plastic surgery, but with neurology are, are prudent because taser burns can lead to problems that are beyond what you see uh, at the skin. And that's why we, some people die from a taser burn because the energy travels through the body and injures the heart nerves, the ones that make the heart beat. And that's why some people don't survive a taser burn. Uh, it's just a matter of you know, how much resistance there was at the time that they were tasered. So um, we do see some of those uh, folks, and usually there is a permanent injury, uh, sadly. It's not something that um, is, you know, comes and goes. Um, we, the, we, we also have seen uh, burns, some of the burns from the, um, the phones, uh, the Samsung phones, and... Um, the, the principles there are also there's there's some similarities with the uh, with the taser, but again, this is beyond the scope of this presentation. Okay, thank you. You can continue with the presentation. Okay, the the main thing with plastic surgery, I was going to mention, in general, your experts don't disagree with each other because our science, most of it is visible or palpable, or could be touched. And very often, your plastic surgery expert is not going to be challenged. And if he is challenged, it's, they usually agree on everything except the uh, extent of damages, because, I mean, you can't argue about permanency. But now with the relative value fee schedule, with the CPT and ICD terminology, the, the, the future medicals can be standardized so you whether it be plaintiff for defense you can look at the fee schedules and get a handle on the future medicals and again as a reminder that uh, the disability books do have information about the disability rating so chemical burns to me are, are, are fascinating um, they I used to think before I learned a lot about chemical burns that whenever you had a chemical burn, you just you rinse it off. You rinse it off. 
Well, not all chemical burns respond well to water. Some chemicals, if you pour water on the chemical burn, it's going to make it worse. So it's important before you dump water on a chemical burn, you could probably dump it on a flame burn with impunity, uh, to, to look at the container and see what kind of uh, chemical antidote is recommended because you can make the problem worse. Uh, believe it or not, certain chemicals, if you put water on them, can actually cause a, 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 things to get a lot worse. So here's a patient with a chemical burn, but I'm going to illustrate some of the principles here. Even though this is a chemical burn, this could have been a, a long-term result of a, of a flame burn. This could have been uh, an electrical burn. It's the same sequelae. Uh, it, it is a common pathway. And it isn't just a matter of describing the size of the scar. That is very, uh, it's a big disservice to the patient's evaluation. It's describing the texture of the skin again. It's describing the color changes, the lack of suppleness, the diminished two-point discrimination, the range of motion, how this affects the patient's uh, daily living, uh, or does the pain wake them from sleep? Do they itch and burn? Is there evidence of itching and burning? Is there a contracture, which means is there because of the shortage of soft tissue? Uh, it's way more than saying there's a five centimeter scar there, and uh, that. It, uh, I think the days of plastic surgery reports being a half a page, I hope, are mostly gone because they're a tremendous disservice to the patient. So a, your expert should not only describe what he sees and feels and photographs, what the patient says, what they can measure, but then your expert should describe to the jury and to the judge what can be done and when it can be done. Uh, an injury such as this, again, could be treated by injections, of various medications. I described them previously. Whether it be a steroid, whether it be uh, other medicines, whether it be the patient's own blood, patient's own. What you can do is take blood from his other arm, put it in a centrifuge, spin it, spin it around. Once it's sp spinned around, you inject the uh, healthy plasma and stem cells into the zone of injury, and then you can get this area to become a lot more supple. I will share with you that the results of PRP are good, whether they're done, this is called platelet-rich plasma, are good whether they were done early on or they were done late. It doesn't matter where the inflammatory process you inject the PRP. Then laser, and I will demonstrate, I will describe two types of laser to my audience. One is ablative in nature, and the other is non-ablative in nature. Non-ablative would be what they call a light-based laser. A light-based laser in a scar like this would not be of much benefit. If this scar was red, a light-based laser may be helpful. However, in a scar such as this, you have to consider an ablative laser. Ablative means that you actually recreate the injury. You recreate the uh, burn, whether it be chemical, electrical, or flame. You recreate it. And by, then you control the healing in a way that you line up the collagen in a more parallel fashion. So here you're actually letting, you're setting the clock back, if you will. Very, it's fascinating. What you do with the blade of laser is you actually recreate the injury and then you control the healing and control the inflammatory process in a way that is um, helpful to the patient. It's a, a second bite of the apple, if you will. But no matter what you do, there's always going to be some disability. But an ablative laser uh, would be helpful. Ablative lasers usually are done uh, with anesthesia because they can be painful. Um, they do have uh, downsides. Every treatment has a plus, has a plan. Every treatment has an alternative. But uh, they do provide some good results uh, to the patients, ablative lasers. Then what you can finally do is consider the patient for um, plastic surgery would be to excise and revise the scar. Uh, we are surrounded by agents that cause chemical burns. We are surrounded by uh, all types of 
things that look innocuous, all types of objects that you, you never think would cause a problem, but we frequently see these agents causing a problem. And again, before you rinse it off, uh, read the label or call poison control. This is the same patient here, and this demonstrates the um, extent of the burn, like any injury has to do with the how long it's in contact with the chemical, whether there is other injuries, such as the patient breathing the chemical, uh, the age of the patient, the concentration. Obviously, we have charts that can tell us uh, how strong the chemical was and how long they were uh, exposed to the chemical and more or less give an idea how much a percentage of burn it would cause. And as a reminder, we have same charts for scalding burns. This demonstrates a contracture. Again, ignore the word chemical burns continued. It's just to demonstrate a contracture. This thumb should be hitchhiking a lot more than it is. The reason it's contracted is because the skin has in, is been injured, the skin is short, and the principles are exactly the same to relieve the contracture. You have to start with non-surgical uh, uh, therapeutic modalities, such as I described, and then if that doesn't succeed, you may do an operation, what we call a Z-plasty, a Z-plasty, which means to rearrange the skin. What you want to do, and this is a principle of plastic surgery, is you want to bring healthy, uninjured tissue, either adjacent or from far away, into the zone of trauma. And sometimes you have to borrow from Peter to pay Paul, but as long as, you know, Peter can afford it, we, we make these trades every day. A Z-plasty is an example of how we make the trade. We would take tissue either that was close to the zone or tissue that was far away, and that injured t uninjured tissue would be brought into the injured area. To some extent, you have to recreate the injury in order to make this possible, but again, it's, it's worth recreating the injury because you can control the healing. This has to do with the, the first aid, and we've discussed this previously. And, of course, as a uh, lawyer, your job, not my job, is to go find out, you know, what caused the problem. These are largely, the majority are preventable. Somebody didn't follow the safety rules. Somebody left something someplace that shouldn't have been left. Somebody was warned. There is almost always, with these types of burns, almost I would say the majority of burns in my experience, there's always something in retrospect that could have made this uh, less likely. And it's important to get a very exact timeline as to what happened and where it happened. And then, again, photographs are critical. When, an, when a patient comes to me for a medical legal evaluation, any photographs showing the injury in its acute configuration are much appreciated. And whenever possible, I know it's difficult sometimes to get records, especially from these larger centers, if I could get records describing what was done, this allows me to bring my report to life. Even a discharge summary or an operative note. The, the more information that your client brings into my office when they come in, the better I can help the jury understand the situation. So I just mentioned that to you so that it would be helpful to your clients. That. I think what I'm going to do now is um, go ahead and we have 10 minutes left. Is uh, I'll take additional questions. Thank you. If all the attendees can enter in the passcode, the password for today is burn. Quick question. Quick facts. One year suffers second degree burns to 9% of his BSA. Less than three months later, baby looks fine. Any potential long-term effects? Okay, that's a great question. It, it, it was probably 
if there's no evidence of the burn at three months, it's probably a first degree or a scalding burn. However, this is where you have to look very, very careful. I use a magnifying glass. Maybe across the room there's not much, but there may be something to see with the magnifying glass. And this is where you have to take your fingers and get an idea of, of the texture of the skin. And that skin is probably going to be more susceptible to sunlight when the child is more fully grown. I think a case like this certainly calls for periodic reevaluation until the child is more fully grown. I'd recommend a case like this as a minimum surveillance twice a year until the child is fully grown to monitor for problems. And in our state, that is part of the damages um, is the medically necessary office visits for surveillance. That was probably a first degree burn, not a second degree, if there's no scar. Next question, in applying the rules of palms, does one use the size of a hand with fingers or without fingers, i.e. only the palm? It is the uh, whole hand. <laughs> great. That was a great question. I should have made that clear. It's a whole hand. Next question, do people of color have special problems recovering from burn, from burn injuries? If so, do you use different treatment methods for them? Oh my gosh, what a great question. By coincidence, this summer, um, this is like a commercial, I'm giving a talk on uh, scarring in the non-Caucasian skin. That is absolutely a important topic because in our country, in fact, worldwide, the number of people percentage-wise with non-Caucasian skin is increasing. And this particular percentage of people has a higher incidence of forming abnormal scars, specifically two types. One is called keloid, and the other is called hypertrophic. Keloid means the scar is growing outside of its boundary of injury, and hypertrophic means it is growing higher but not wider necessarily. Uh, lots of special considerations, lots and lots and lots. One special consideration is that their medical charges are going to be considerably higher. Number one, because their surgery may not be successful without ancillary treatment, and ancillary treatment may include radiation, it may include other modalities that are not necessary in Caucasian skin, and uh, uh, damages in this population are, are clear. Two people with the same damage, the non Caucasian injured person is going to have a higher disability rating, is going to have a higher future medical, and is going to have a more complicated uh, management scheme. And that's just uh, what we're going to see more and more of uh, as the uh, demographic shift, you know, worldwide, not just in the United States, but worldwide. Um, what, what can I do? Real quickly, what I can do when I see these people. Is we we and we are more aggressive with managing the inflammation. We we start the steroids sooner. We start the compression sooner. We start the massage sooner. We are way more proactive in this population than we are with other with Caucasian skin because we know that they are um, hazards around the corner. There's problematic healing, and once the healing is established, it's even more problematic to deal with. So. Uh, unfortunately, this population of patients is going to cost the medical system uh, more resources. Hope that Next question. That question. Do you determine what chemical caused the burn several months after the incident? Yes, we can. There, there are configurations. There are colors. There's histories. Yes, and, and I'm sometimes asked to describe whether this was an acid or an alkali. And so not only can I describe sometimes uh, the temperature of the water, the amount of contact, even though I'm not a scientist, I can also uh, do a little bit of forensic plastic surgery and give the person a sense whether it's an acid or an alkali and describe possibly uh, what should have been done, what wasn't done, uh, the proper safety measures, proper first aid. Yes. Next question. Can the audience, later? There are tables. Yes, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but there are tables available to the lawyers that describe not only the uh, temperature of the water with the um, uh, 
the amount, amount of burn. There's also a lot of temperatures that I, a lot of tables I found that give a sense of the jury verdicts related to how negligent the person was and how uh, much the burn was and so forth. Uh, the, there's actually pretty good research of how juries come back with burn cases. I'm sorry to interrupt that. It's okay. Please go ahead. Um, can a burn later cause skin cancer in the same place? Okay, great question again. I have testified in the past that yes. However, there is evolving literature. There's a, a test from a uh, paper from Sweden where the, uh, uh, hundreds of burn patients were followed for 20 or 30 years, and there was no greater incidence of skin cancer. So science marches on. So now I would not be able to testify as to a greater incidence of skin cancer with a burn because uh, the, the evolving science has shown this not to be the case, that there is no relationship between uh, burns and skin cancer. Next question. Do you think hyperbaric oxygen helps a burn heal faster? Well, these are some great questions. Okay, well, there is conflicting literature. There is some literature that clearly states that hyperbaric oxygen accelerates burns healing and helps with the pain and is, is pro uh, everything good, you know, diminishes inflammation, increases well-being. However, there's other papers that show it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. It's certainly not abusive to try hyperbaric oxygen for burns, but there are differences of opinion as to how effective it is. What products can help a burn pain receive relief? Silvadine is very soothing. Aloe vera is very soothing. Uh, uh, ice is, is don't you don't want to cause a frost burn. Uh, continued irrigation. There's no doubt that uh, there's a lot of very soothing remedies out there. If something burns, your body's saying don't use it. It should be uh, pro, uh, you know, re relief. It should be helpful to your to the pain. Otherwise, you can switch agents. Aloe vera is very good. Next question. Can loads of exposure tie-wise factor into the severity of a scold burn so that longer exposure to the lower temperature water can create the same burn as shorter exposure with high temperature? Absolutely. Yes. Yes, yes. And there are well-recognized tables that describe that. Because we're often, this is a big part of uh, a forensic plastic surgery is describing the temperature of the water uh, in a skull type of injury. Yes. Last question. Is there anything that can be done for a burn scar contractor? Absolutely. Burn scar contractures uh, can be helped by a variety of methods besides plastic surgery. One is the injections, two is the uh, steroid therapy is very, very helpful, uh, a compressive garment, uh, one can also do uh, the laser, as I mentioned, the ablative, most likely. One can then consider a surgical approach, such as a Z-plasty, which is re shifting or removing the injured skin that's contracted and replacing it with uncontracted, healthy skin. So we want to replace like with like. So we take injured skin, remove it, and replace it with uninjured skin. Thank you so much for the presentation, Dr. Zayden. In addition to being your best source for testifying as consulting experts for the past 60 years, TASA also offers e-discovery and forensic solutions, free interactive webinars, day in the life videos. We also offer research reports on expert witnesses, including the Challenge History Report 2.0, Professional Sanction Search, and Expert Profile 360. Please remember that if you're applying for CLE credit today, you must attend for the full 60 minutes of the presentation. You are also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for attending, and most especially Thomas Zayden for his time and effort in creating this presentation. If you would like to speak with Thomas or if you would like to speak with a TASA representative regarding an expert witness for a case you are currently working on, please contact TASA at 1-800-523-2319. 
One of my colleagues will be following up with you regarding your feedback on today's presentation. Again, thank you all for attending. This concludes our presentation for today.